Excellent. So Dr. Peter Tech is a board certified urologist who grew up in the Western suburbs of Chicago. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in bioengineering from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He went on to earn his medical degree from Midwestern University and served on multiple education boards. He also went on to specialize in urological surgery at Franciscan James, St. James Health and served as chief resident. In addition, he is an adjunct assistant professor of bioengineering in the Department of Medicine at University of Illinois at Chicago, where he works on novel medical devices. Dr. Tech has multiple patents and patent pending technologies that are currently being developed. He is widely published and presented and has presented in national urology journals and conferences. Dr. Tech is a member of the American Urological Association and specializes in minimally invasive urologic procedures, endourology, and male sexual health. Dr. Tech, if you could please unmute your mic. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and I'll turn, I'll turn it, over it over to you. Thank you so much for having me, Jack, and thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks everybody who's uh, participating in this uh, webinar today. I appreciate your time. Um, I am uh, uh, Dr. Tech. Uh, I specialize, I'm a board certified specialist in urological surgery. Um, and today's uh, topic is going to be on uh, BPH, essentially uh, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, I've been treating BPH in general and performing, you know, different types of surgeries for BPH over the last nine years. And it's actually one of my most favorite um, uh, disease processes to treat uh, because in this field particularly, um, there's a lot of advancements in technology. And as you can tell from my background, I, I do have a strong passion for novel technology and medical devices. So I do have a few uh, patent and patent pending technologies. Um, so what we'll cover today is uh, essentially a, the prostate overview, because uh, I know we throw the term, you know, enlargement of prostate around, uh, but most people, um, it's not really unclear what the prostate is or what it does, but uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of that. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, BPH overview and some of the treatment options available for you. So um, the prostate is an organ uh, about the size of a walnut um, right at the base of the bladder. It surrounds uh, the urethra kind of like a donut would. Um, its main function is to produce the fluid that uh, uh, combines with semen uh, in the ejaculate. The normal size uh, uh, is around 20 grams and it begins to grow in your sort of mid 40s for most men. Now there are different disease proce processes that can affect the prostate. Um, the one we're going to be talking about and focusing on today is uh, BPH or enlargement of the prostate. Uh, but there are other conditions like prostatitis and prostate cancer that uh, we won't really go into detail with but uh, can also affect the prostate. So uh, Commonly known as an enlarged prostate, BPH stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, the normal adult size is around 20 grams or about 1.5 inches in diameter. Um, when the prostate enlar enlarges, it, it creates sort of a plumbing issue which can obstruct the bladder, um, causing a lot of lower urinary tract symptoms. Very important though, uh, uh, BPH's relationship to prostate cancer, it is not prostate cancer. Um, and it, it does not cause prostate cancer. They can be very similar in presentation with some of the uh, obstructive symptoms, but, um, and they can also coexist. Um, there are things we do to delineate between the two during your evaluation. Um, one of them being the PSA, which is a blood test, uh, but that alone does not distinguish the two uh, from each other um, because both BPH and prostate cancer can cause elevations in your PSA level. So, when the prostate enlarges, uh, what it does is it pushes pressure on the urethra, kind of like um, a plumbing system. It would just, the valves start to close up. Um, the prostate size does not necessarily correlate with the degree of obstruction or severity of symptoms though. Some of the symptoms you can encounter when uh, of BPH include uh, frequency of urination, uh, the sudden urge to urinate, um, sometimes burning or painful urination, a uh, weak stream, um, even feelings that you're not emptying your bladder all the way, um, and trouble stop, stopping and starting your flow, um, and even the inability to urinate. So BPH is actually very common. Um, uh, and patients who have BPH, 95% uh, of them with uh, moderate symptoms aren't very happy with their symptoms uh, if they were to live with it the rest of their lives. And there is uh, some correlation between a sexual function as well, which we do see. 
Um, and as I stated earlier, BPH is one of the most common prostate problems for men over 50. Uh, by the age of 60, we do know that about 50% of men are afflicted by this disorder. Um, and by 85, 90% of men, um, uh, and just as in general, 14 million men uh, in the United States suffer from some sort of lower urinary tract symptom. Um, we have found some associations with obesity, a higher body mass index, and lack of exercise, which can increase your risk of an enlarged prostate. So when you come for evaluation, when we're trying to delineate some of these things for an enlarged prostate, um, there are some things we do as part of the exam. Um, it, it's, it's usually not the most uh, fun part of the exam, but uh, we do check the, the prostate itself. And the way to do this, unfortunately, is through the, the rectum. So um, uh, it, it's usually pretty quick and painless, but can, you know, it it's usually provides a lot of just uh, uh, fare for men. But um, then we also can record um, how much residual urine you have left in your bladder after you urinate. Um, if it's high, it usually delineates that you're not emptying your bladder all the way. Uh, and we can also actually test your flow and record how good your stream is. Um, and then we do ask um, you fill out some forms which can help us quantify uh, the degree of symptoms you're having with some of these uh, symptom score, uh, uh, score sheets. So after you're diagnosed with an enlarged prostate, what are some of the treatment options that uh, are available? So. Um, usually we start with sort of behavioral modifications. Um, you know, if, if you're having trouble urinating at night or frequently, we do, we do try to lower your fluid uh, intake, which can, uh, you know, allow you to produce less urine and also improve some of the urinary symptoms. Uh, if you're not too bothered by it, sometimes we just watch. We watch it and observe it and, and until you get to a point where you are bothered enough to try something. Um, there are pelvic floor exercises and Kegel exercises that can improve uh, urination, uh, you know, it, it is a little more difficult than men to do, uh, but uh, there are, there's a lot of data points to show that it does work. Um, some of the other first line options available are uh, BPH medications, which uh, we'll review. Um, there's also uh, non-surgical options like the resume therapy and um, Urolift, which are permanent implants that can open up the urethra. Um, and then there are more uh, uh, minimally invasive surgeries that uh, which we can do, including the green light, um, the transurethral resection of the prostate and a prostatectomy, which is removal of the prostate. And you can see from degree of invasiveness from left to right, uh, the farther you get right, the more invasive it is. So uh, a big question we get all the time, because you'll see a lot of uh, commercials on TV and a lot of over-the-counter supplements. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of controversy existing this, and, and you know, the, the, there's not much data to show that some of these uh, dietary supplements or uh, phytotherapies like sal palmetto are are effective, but um, at this time the American Urologic Association doesn't have a, a recommendation for them because there's uh, uh, the data is a little limited. So, um, so watchful waiting. One one option for you know treating BPHs, um, we we essentially can adjust your uh, diet, fluid intake, and things like that. Um, and medication use. Some patients are on diuretics, which can uh, make your symptoms worse. Uh, so the timing of which we can adjust, um, you know, uh, the, the you know the, the benefit of this is there's really no treatment for this. We just kind of watch it and see how it goes. Um, and and some of the behavioral modifications aren't as um, uh, doesn't really affect the quality of life at all. So. Uh, once your symptoms become a little more advanced, um, there are a lot of medications that are available. Uh, these are the alpha blockers, commonly known as Flomax or Rapaflo. Um, what they really do is they, they relax the prostatic and bladder neck to allow more of an opening of that channel um, to allow you to urinate a little better. Um, uh, these are pretty well tolerated, but there are some potential side effects like any medications um, uh, in that because they're relaxing the prostatic neck, they can sometimes affect the blood vessels too and cause uh, lowering of your blood pressure, which can lead to dizziness uh, and drop in blood pressure and things like that. So. Um, and then there's the five alpha reductase inhibitors um, known as finasteride is a common one. Uh, these can shrink the prostate. They work by uh, affecting the hormone levels uh, that, that essentially grow the prostate. Um, these tend to work well, but do take some time to kick in, usually on average about six months to actually have any effect. Um, 
The biggest complaint we do have though is uh, these drugs can have a profound effect on sexual function. Um, and you see that stat right there, 75 or 71% of uh, patients stop the medication within a year because of some of these bothersome side effects. Um, and, and as we go in now towards more um, intervention, um, one of the, the newest treatment on the market out there is the resume water vapor therapy. Um, it's, it's a non-surgical or minimally invasive procedure that we do as an outpatient. Um, it essentially uses natural energy stored in water vapor to shrink the prostate. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these in the office um, recently and we've gotten great results. Um, the benefit is there's, we, we can do this without anesthesia. Um, there's no permanent implants, um, and the, the data through five years looks pretty robust, meaning the reoperation rates, it's very low, 4.4%. Uh, um, and as anytime we do any sort of uh, procedure into the prostate, there can be some potential side effects. Um, that includes blood in the urine, semen. Uh, sometimes your frequency and urgency can get worse shortly after, uh, but the end goal is to get it better once everything kind of relaxes a bit. And then I'm going to play this video for you just to show you some of the or how the actual procedures performed here. Resume uses the natural energy stored in water vapor or steam. Clinical studies support that Resume relieves BPH symptoms safely and effectively, eliminating the need for BPH medications while also preserving sexual function. During each 9-second treatment, Sterile water vapor is released throughout the targeted prostate tissue. When the steam contacts the tissue and turns back into water, all the stored energy is released, causing the cells to die. Over time, your body's natural healing response absorbs the dead cells, shrinking the prostate. With the extra tissue removed, the urethra opens, reducing BPH symptoms. Most patients begin to experience symptom relief as soon as two weeks, and maximum benefit may occur within three months. So, um, with this therapy we've been offering, patients tend to be very satisfied with uh, in, in their own cohort of 255 patients, 97% of patients would recommend this to a friend. Another non-surgical or minimally invasive procedure uh, that we've been doing a lot is also called the Urolift or prosthetic urethral lift. Um, this one involves putting implants into the urethra and opening up the channel. Um, again, you could do this without anesthesia. Um, there are permanent implants um, involved with this, and the data through five years is also pretty robust in that uh, this one has a, only a reoperation rate of about 13.6%. Um, uh, and with, again, you know, common with any urologic procedure, urinary frequency, short-term, blood in your urine, um, some discomfort in the pelvis uh, can occur afterwards, but usually long-term, uh, patients do much better, and uh, we've been having great results with this too. So going more towards uh, surgical intervention now, um, which does require general anesthesia, um, uh, is the green light laser therapy. Um, these next few treatment options are a little different than the ones we just talked about in that um, these are now involving more uh, removal of tissue. We're actually, uh, you know, with the green light, we're vaporizing tissue um, and removing, you know, some of the blockage. Um, uh, the results for the green light are also great as well. The reoperation rate is about 4.8% at five years. Uh, even at 20 years, the reoperation is quite low for these. Again, similar side effect potential anytime we put a camera in there. Uh, you know, frequency, urgency, blood in the urine, pain. Um, uh, urinary retention is not that common post-op after this one, but can occur. Um, and, you know, what we do is we actually, the reason why it's called the green light is the laser that we use actually operates in the, the green light spectrum, which um, uh, helps to minimize bleeding and things like that. And it gives us a pretty robust uh, vaporization of the, the prostate itself.
Um, the next surgical option, this is probably the oldest uh, uh, procedure for enlarged prostate. It's called the transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, some patients refer to this as the rotorooter. Um, uh, there's a lot of data on the market uh, from this because it's been around for so long. And it, this is actually one of the first uh, treatments for BPH. We, um, even in the 1800s, they, uh, one of the first medical devices ever created was for this procedure. Um, it was kind of archaic, but it, it looked like a long stick with a little blade at the end, but they'd put it in blindly and then release the blade and then they would start scraping out parts of the prostate. Um, as you can imagine, it, it, uh, the, the results of were, weren't that great because of the blind procedure. But uh, then we started developing cameras and, and optics and things that we could actually see what was going on. Um, uh, this actually is still, because we have so much data on this procedure, it's still considered the gold standard to compare all other uh, BPA surgeries to. Um, you know, one of the dilemmas uh, with the surgery, though, is there tends to be a lot more bleeding um, Usually we have to admit you into the hospital overnight too because of the bleeding. Um, but uh, again, this is sort of one of the oldest procedures used for treating BPH. Um, and then the, the most invasive uh, type of treatment for an enlarged prostate is, is actually removal of the prostate. Um, in order to do this, we'd have to make a, an incision over the lower abdomen and actually uh, remove the inner part of the prostate. Again, um, uh, very high risk of bleeding and blood transfusions. And because it's so invasive, uh, you know, uh, sepsis, which is a, a body, a systemic infection in your body. Um, this isn't done as often anymore, given how many different alternatives there are with minimum invasive procedures, so. Um, so for insurance companies, you know, obviously there's a thousand insurance uh, available plan. So most insurances do cover this, but it's definitely, uh, you know, part of the patient's responsibility to contact the insurance provider. And, and we actually have a team that actually can also help with that as well. Um, so, you know, in summary, essentially, you know, treatment options for an enlarged prostate, um, we can either do watchful waiting where we just kind of monitor your symptoms, offer some behavioral modifications and pelvic floor exercises. Uh, and then first line therapy includes medications, uh, resume and, and the Urolift, and then more invasive surgical uh, uh, procedures include the green light, the TERP or the, the prostatectomy. Um, so really, um, you know, the, the next step, if you're having any of these symptoms is to contact, uh, you know, your, your urology or our office and to uh, determine which one would be best for you. So I think we'll open up for questions now.